Performing the periscope technique gently for office tubal patency assessment. Accurately testing patients is central to giving them effective therapy. Non-IVF therapies such as oral medication and insemination don't work nearly as well if bilateral tubal occlusion is present. Unilateral occlusion is also important to identify as insemination is highest yield when patency is on the side of a dominant follicle. This has even greater cost-effectiveness implications when using donor sperm. We have recently published a new approach to office tubal patency assessment called the periscope technique. It combines flexible office hysteroscopy with air-infused saline. Air bubbles that traverse the ostea at hysteroscopy predict full tubal patency at laparoscopic chromoperturbation. Our large study showed 98.3 to 100% sensitivity to tubal occlusion and 83.7% specificity relative to laparoscopy. Some might think of this technique as hysteroscopically viewed sonosalpingography where if air-infused saline can be viewed traversing the tubes with ultrasound, one can observe the same process with a camera. Without being able to see past the ostea, some might be concerned about potential proximal patency with distal occlusion. Theoretically, air bubbles could accumulate in hydrosalpinges falsely suggesting patency, but this has not been an issue in our published experience. To minimize this risk, though we just showed an example of the technique being performed in under 30 seconds to demonstrate speed, we prefer assessing the uterine cavity for at least 10 seconds before adding bubbles so as to allow pressure equilibration. Sonography before or after hysteroscopy may demonstrate hydrosalpinges, explaining why air bubbles did not traverse the ostea. Apart from the 2.5 millimeter flexible pediatric hysteroscope and associated equipment, the technique needs the minimal supplies of saline and IV tubing. While a speculum, chlorhexidine, and swabs can also be used, a vaginoscopic approach without them is also possible. We briefly invert the IV tubing drip chamber to introduce approximately one quarter of a milliliter of air. For us, this is approximately a three centimeter column. With a slower rate of flow, the column may need to be inverted longer. By comparison, five to 10 milliliters or more can be used for sonosalpingography and two to five milliliters is introduced intravascularly for echocardiograms. Brief flicking of the column creates a finer stream of bubbles allowing for better bilateral dispersion. Beyond having an empty bladder so that air bubbles rise to the ostea, another consideration is that patients may have to roll their hips so that air bubbles are adjacent to the ostea. Using the non-dominant hand to stabilize the hysteroscope against the perineum helps avoid removal of the hysteroscope during patient repositioning. Though the periscope technique seems to have a low rate of tubal spasm, transient relaxation of spasm is readily observed. Our experience has been that gentle technique is central to reducing spasm. Core considerations for gentle technique to reduce spasm include a small caliber hysteroscope. For practically all nulliparous patients, we used a 2.5 millimeter hysteroscope, which is narrower than the cervical lumen for most nulliparous women. Also, flexible hysteroscopy helps because rigid hysteroscopy is more likely to abrade the cervix, particularly in the setting of an empty bladder to make air bubbles rise to the ostea. Avoiding overdistension also matters, which is particularly common with a stenotic cervix and bilateral tubal occlusion. This is an important source of pain in HSG and sonosalpingography approaches that occlude outflow of dye or saline. Vaginoscopy also likely helps, but for design reasons was not included in our current data for patient experience. Our patients seem to experience far less pain with hysteroscopic assessment than with HSG. This is in spite of less than a third using any over-the-counter analgesics prior 
and almost none using stronger medication. After adjusting for the more complicated statistics of crossover data, where patients serve as their own controls and are compared to themselves, the periscope technique resulted in a 110-fold lower likelihood of maximum discomfort, findings that are very unlikely to be by chance. Comparison of pain from HSG relative to hysteroscopy was done at the time of hysteroscopy for almost all patients who had HSGs, including hysteroscopies performed by junior residents. Though there is the potential for patients to have recall bias for HSG-associated pain, this is unlikely to account for almost a third of patients reporting the maximum level of pain with HSG, while only one person over several years describing this with hysteroscopic assessment. Of note, most patients having maximum discomfort on HSG had no pain with hysteroscopy and almost all had mild to no pain. Also, patients overwhelmingly preferred office hysteroscopic assessment of tubal patency to HSG. In summary, the periscope technique is accurate, gentle, is preferred by patients, and easy to learn. We look forward to others' experience with this new approach to office tubal patency assessment.